I'm going to be reading Swift Rivers by Cornelia Meeks. I'm going to start with chapter one, break it into three parts. So this is chapter 1A. Chapter one is titled White Birches. It was the summer that Chris Stahlberg was 17 that he mowed the high meadow alone for the first time. More than one of the men hired for the harvesting on the yellow slopes of his uncle's farm in the valley below had offered help, but he thanked them and shook his head with determination. He and grandfather had cut the tall, wild hay of that meadow year after year ever since Chris was a little boy trotting behind grandfather's swinging scythe. Since, for some reason, grandfather had not come down the valley this year to help with the harvesting, Chris was bound that no one else should wield a blade among the nodding grass, the sweet fern, and the scattered flowers. It seemed as though they always worked there on just the same sort of a late summer day, still and a little, still and a little hot, beginning their labor just as the sun came up from behind the silent forested hills to glitter on the feathery grass tops all delicately beaded with dew. Later, all the low ground would be flooded with sunlight. The sky would be quivering blue and the air would be so clear that Chris could see for miles past the woods which surrounded the hillside meadow. He could look down upon the floor of the valley lined with long grain fields and along the course of the meandering Goosewing River to where the hills opened like a gate to someone un some unknown world beyond. But he could never stop long to look about him for he must keep up with grandfather, working steadily with that long swing of his blade, which ate through the tough stems like fire through stubble. Ease it down, grandfather would say in his deep Swedish voice as the grass rippled and dropped before his seemingly effortless stroke. He did not have to stop working as he talked and so could tell Chris all about how that tumbled, disarranged place in the stone wall must have been made weeks ago by a bear scrambling over clumsily to look for strawberries in the new grass. That dark speck which floated in the blue shimmer above the hilltops was an eagle. Then there would follow a story of the wary wild creatures which hovered about farmsteads in Sweden, or of the bolder animals who used to dispute with man the possession of this newly settled region of the American North Country. It was strange to be working there alone today, after Grandfather had always come so regularly on the first day of the harvest season. The dry hardness of Uncle Nels's voice seemed to take some of the sparkle out of the bright air of the summer morning, when he said to Chris, setting out up the hill with his scythe on his shoulder, Old Alexis Stahlberg finds himself getting stiff and feeble at last, I expect, and not able to lend us a hand with the work anymore. Well, get forward and take your gun with you to bring back a few trusses of wild hay from that meadow which you and your grandfather call yours, that is nothing. But fetch us enough partridges for the harvester's dinner and I will try to think that you are beginning to be of a little use on the place at last. Chris had tramped off along the rough cart track which looped upward through the woods, his dark blue eyes on the grassy ruts before him, his blonde head bent and his whole tall figure seeming to be bowed by the burden of loneliness. Was grandfather really going to leave him alone now to do his work as best he could under the unloving eye of Uncle Nels Anderson? When he came inside of the little meadow, however, that bit of open ground cut out of the close growing birch woods, he straightened suddenly and began to whistle. He leaned his gun against the wall, took off his coat, wetted his side to a perfect edge and began. One, two, he took the long strokes with the smooth rhythm of a dancer. He knew instantly how much he had increased in power since a year ago. He was almost equal in grandfather's skill and, to his surprise, far exceeding grandfather's strength. It was well after mid-morning, with a third of the field already cut, that he stopped to rest for the first time. Just as he lowered his scythe, there broke into his thoughts the sudden noise of crashing and trampling amongst the trees beyond the wall, the headlong galloping of some big animal. A deer? An elk, even? No wild thing would ever make such tumult as that, unless it might be a moose, wounded and angry. But this was a horse, a slim, black creature with an empty saddle and a broken bridle, which came dashing through the thickets to leap over the wall. Chris had never seen a horse jump before. The good cart horses of Uncle Nels's farms would have been as incapable of such a feat as of spreading wings for flight. That beautiful lifting of the head and knees together, that quick, agile bound like a rabbit's, which carried the graceful animal over, where was there anything to be seen like it? 
The boy had seen deer leap like that, but deer were small and light compared with this glorious creature of grace and power. The horse stopped, wheeled, and stood for an instant knee-deep in the flowery grass. In that second, a shot sounded from the wood, the sharp, thin crack of a rifle. Chris felt a strange, sudden jar, which went tingling up his arm. The bullet had not hit him, but had glanced against the shaft of the scythe and knocked it from his hand. With a snort of terror, the horse wheeled again and made for the lower stretch of the wall. Chris knew that to leap that barrier meant sure destruction, for just beyond it lay a long slope of rock, slippery with moss, and ending in an abrupt drop many yards below. He was near enough by being quick as light to intercept the frantic creature, to catch its black forelock and cling stubbornly in spite of rearing and kicking of snorting nostrils and flying hooves. Chris had stopped the big farm horses in just that way, but their heavy plunging was very different from the spirited struggle of this splendid thing. The horse stood still at last, trembling, its dark coat shining with sweat. There, there, Chris passed a gentle hand along its wet, quivering neck. It was pain to him to see any animal suffer, even with fear. But what is this? He exclaimed in wonder aloud, as though the horse could answer. So close to the edge of the field had the struggle come that, with the final plunge, a pair of saddlebags had been thrown over the beast's lower head and had split against the wall. Curious objects came tumbling out of them lumps of differently colored minerals, while there rolled almost to the boy's feet two dark stones all shot through with shining yellow. They flashed in the sun as he picked them up. At the same instant, there was again that thin, evil crack of a shot from the woods. A second bullet struck with a vicious snick against the wall just behind him. He dropped the stones into his pocket and, in one long stride, he had re reached his gun. He stood holding it poised, ready to level at once the moment a flash from the thicket showed him whether to aim. He was aware from the direction of the accurately placed bullets that the shots had been far more for the purpose of driving him away from the horse than from a real attempt upon his life. He was the more roused and indignant for that very reason. This horse might have been killed, he raged hotly. Slowly he moved out into the open, anxious to give some return on his own part as a warning to that skulker in the bushes. He was scarcely prepared, however, to see someone appear, suddenly and boldly, in the gap of the wall which did duty for a gate. The newcomer, bareheaded in the sunshine, was evidently not far from the same age as Chris Dahlberg, older perhaps by three or four years. At sight of him, the black horse whinnied and trotted across the, to drop its velvety nose and nuzzle its master's breast. Without seeming to heed Chris and his ready gun, the other bent down to smooth the animal's black coat and to examine its straight, slim legs. Chris, as he watched the youth's anxiety for the safety of his horse, felt a sudden rush of knowledge that here was no lurking adversary who would shoot from hiding. He was across the meadow in an instant, the gun in the crook of his arm. I think he isn't hurt, he began in somewhat awkward reassurance. But he might have gone over the wall to break all the bones on the rocks below. The owner of the horse straightened up to smile at him gratefully, a quick flashing smile that was like a glint of swift water in the sunshine. With his rumpled dark hair and thin clean cut features, he was unlike any of the blonde Swedish and German settlers of that valley which held Chris Dahlberg's whole acquaintance. His clothes, a linen shirt, and corded riding breeches were unbelievably worn and were repaired here and there with buckskin patches, clumsily applied. And since this afternoon on the North Country hillside was nearly a hundred years ago, his hair was cut a little longer than the manner of the present day and always had the look of having just been pushed back from the boy's sunburned forehead by some recent and violent gesture. The two surveyed each other steadily. As Chris let the stock of his gun slip to the ground, he spoke his bewilderment aloud, beginning in the middle. Then who was it who was shooting from the bushes? Oh, did they have a shot at you too? The older boy held up his arm to show a long slit in his sleeve, evidently cut by a bullet. I've been making a sort of exploring journey through these hills, he explained briefly, and while I pitched my little noon camp down near the river, someone must have spied Pharaoh here and taken a fancy to him. Just as I went down to the stream for water, there was a shout from the thickets that stampeded the horse and then a shot at me as I went after him. But we don't have thieves of that sort in Goosewing Valley, Chris protested. He had heard talk around the farmhouse table of the lawbreakers who drifted through thinly settled country, but who never had been heard of in this immediate neighborhood. This whole region was 
someday, to be the state of Minnesota, but was now only a northerly corner of that vast tract, the Louisiana Purchase, bought just 30 years after, before by the bold wisdom of Thomas Jefferson. Even where settlement was older and closer than just here, there were no banks yet or places for the safekeeping of valuables. Many a thrifty farmer's house might be worth robbing or his choicest stock were sp spiriting away. In this special neighborhood, however, there was not enough wealth to be very tempty, tempting to any of the hard ruffians known to be abroad in the more prosperous regions to the southward. Bears got the colts sometimes and wolves had been known to run down the young sheep but of human robbery, there had been no record. The Indians, the peaceable Chippewa, had moved away to dwell beyond the hills in better hunting grounds than these. They had always been friendly to the whites, so that never, through them, had there been serious threat against the farmer's meager property. Hark, said the strange boy suddenly, lifting his head to listen. The black horse was quieted now, and had fallen to nipping the feathery grass tops standing so tall all about him. The air was very still as the two stood, straining their ears for any further sound. Far away in the wood came the small noise of a twig snapping, as though under a cautiously retreating foot. A moment of silence. Then again, there was a faint rustle and crackling of branches farther away now, since apparently he, he who had coveted the beautiful black pharaoh had given up the hope of laying unlawful hands upon him. But who could it be? Chris kept wondering, since in all of his life in that small neighborhood, he had never heard of a horse as being stolen. There must be more strangers than this one abroad in Goosewing Valley that day. The older boy dismissed the incident as though it was had never been. My name is Stuart Hale, he broke the silence suddenly, and I was on my way to look for you, that is, if you are Chris Dahlberg. I had a message, and I was to find you here in the high meadow. That was where that splendid old man in the cabin at the head of the valley said you were to be today. Chris Dahlberg's face lighted, as it always did at the mention of grandfather. Did he say why he did not come down for the harvesting? Was there anything wrong? There was certainly nothing wrong, returned Stuart. All he told me was that he had a, f had a fancy to see how you would mow the meadow alone this year. He said that when the harvest was all done and your Uncle Nels could spare you, then you were to come up the valley and the two of you would have a glorious three days together. He stood watching the glow of pleasure spread over the younger boy's face and seemed to warm it, warm to it as he added, I have been over your whole mountain range looking for, I can hardly tell you what, but the best thing I found was old Alexis Dahlberg in his house above the river with the great walnut tree before the door. As though by common consent, the two walked together to the fringe of shade beside the wall and sat down upon the warm, rough stones. I came down the road by the river, Stuart went on, and asked the way to the high meadow of some men harvesting in a wheat field. The one who spoke to me gave me such scanty directions that I missed my way coming up the hill. We were hot and tired, Pharaoh and I, so I stopped to rest and water him, and that was how I came so near losing him. I believe from what your grandfather said that it must have been your Uncle Nels Anderson who told me how to go. Under his keen glance, Chris reddened. He could guess with just what surly unfriendliness Uncle Nels had turned away from the stranger who came seeking speech with no better than his nephew, Christian Dahlberg. I've lived with Uncle Nels nearly all my life, he began to explain lamely. There was a time of great sickness when I was little, and it took my father and my mother both. Just before he died, my father arranged with my mother's brother, that was Uncle Nels, that he should care for me until I grew big and that I should work for him and help him until I was 21. It is so, I am told, that things are often arranged, both in the old country and this. My father trusted him and Uncle Nels has kept his promise to give me a home. Grandfather lived here too for a while, but he and my uncle quarreled often. And at last, grandfather went away to live on some forest land which belonged to him at the head of the valley. So that is chapter one through page 12. We'll continue with chapter 1b tomorrow.